Good morning and welcome everyone to another uh, NGI Salon. Um, this morning we are very um, uh, pleased and excited uh, to, uh, to have a, a philosopher uh, on board, which is, and the philosopher is Beatrice Vasi. And she's going, to, um, she's going to talk about explainability. And um, we believe that, that these, this is one of the kind of foundations, one of the foundational aspects that we need to address when we move into this hybrid world, which is an easy thing to, to say, that we are moving in the in-between, between the analog and the virtual and the digital and, and uh, the real. And this is all easily said. But um, when we experience it, this is another matter. And we need also to be able to reflect upon that experience. And in order to reflect on this experience, we need some meta models. We need some meta concepts, which we can work, which we need to inform also the political aspects of this transition. Um, so Beatrice, uh, without further ado, uh, please, uh, uh, we want to please start. And then after Beatrice, we have Loretta Nania and Gay Legar, who will be our first respondents. Um, Please, if you have any uh, uh, ideas, suggestions, questions, put them in the chat and we will address them later. So um, now, Beatrice, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rob, for this introduction and this invitation. Uh, good morning, everybody. Buongiorno. I'm delighted to have the possibility to spend this morning with you, Rob, Loretta, Gail, and of course, the many friends of the Next Generation Internet Initiatives. Thanks also to Elon Tech and the IoT Council for this invitation and for organizing this event today. I'm going to share my screen. Just a second, I'll share my slides. Okay. So, I have 20 minutes today for my introductory talk and I'm keen to use this time well, as what I really want to focus on is the conversation that will follow. With my presentation today, I will do them three things. First, I will review the main line of argumentation of the paper on which this talk is based and I will foreground some of its key claims. I will do that by placing these claims in the larger context of my philosophical project. This will allow me to then conclude by sketching what is next in my research, but also emphasizing what I believe to be those in future important steps in terrorizing artificial intelligence and computational culture. So I'm inviting you on a journey that, because of time constraints, will inevitably have to be uh, <laughs> quite, uh, uh, will have to involve like some high speed traveling. But because of, of that, I will also do my very best to respect the do stops the, uh, along the way. I'll move now to my first slide. The paper that I'm presenting to you and which was part of the information which circulated for this session is entitled Beyond Human, Deep Learning, Explainability and Representation. This piece of research is the result of two years of work and has been published last November in the academic journal Theory, Culture and Society. The paper focuses on computational procedures that are no longer constrained by human modes of representation. I consider how these computational procedures no longer constrained by human modes of representation could be philosophically understood in terms of algorithmic thought. Algorithmic thought is the first keyword that I want to signpost here. I will return on this later in the talk. What I will say right now is that this is a key concept that I'm developing with this work. While introducing this paper, I should start by defining the problem area that it addresses. The problem area is, as the title of the article says, the issue of explainability in deep learning. Interpreting or explaining the decisions made by artificial intelligence is an important challenge for contemporary society. Explainable artificial intelligence, also known sometimes as XAI, is an expression used to describe various techniques and methods they want to do precisely that. Explain why an artificial intelligence system gives a particular response to some data inputs or how it has calculated a certain result. In contemporary artificial intelligence systems, particularly those driven by deep learning techniques, Obtaining such a justification and interpreting it is not as straightforward as it might be expected. Often then, perhaps too often, we hear the press and academia alike talk of these AI systems in terms of black boxes. 
Black box, this is an engineering expression that is borrowed from cybernetics and used to denote an object that is viewed uniquely in terms of its inputs and outputs and whose internal working remains concealed. While parts of computer and data science are not too keen on this black box label, and perhaps later we can discuss why, there remains the fact that once a deep neural net system is trained, for example, it can be difficult to understand its automated learning choices. Many examples could be given here of the aims and rationale of the field of explainable artificial intelligence and how this field attempts to open such black boxes to bring the inner, supposedly hidden mechanism of these computational agents into the realm of human interpretability. One of the examples employed in the article is DARPA's XAI initiative. This initiative comprises of a wide array of projects with different partner, partners and players involved, but the overall explainability effort of the US Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, could be summarized by saying that the challenge for DARPA as well as for other parties involved in the quest for interpretability in AI is to achieve understanding without compromising the predictive power and the overall learning performance of the computational cognitive system. Of course, DARPA recognizes that the opacity of contemporary AI has immensely relevant implications for the way in which AI can be researched, developed, and used by the military. What it's important to say here, however, is that the issue of explainability is crucial well beyond the military industrial complex because of the way in which artificial intelligence is increasingly part of our everyday. Many other examples could be mentioned here, of course, from virtual assistants on my smartphones to algorithms that decide a person's suitability for a job or for a mortgage, for instance. Explainability, then, is a technical challenge with great social, legal and ethical implications. And yes, while the black box label may be often abused or misused, it's true that this label has gained much currency because what the public is asking for is transparency as regards the way in which government, media, retail, finance, science and industry, they all employ AI on a daily basis, often to judge or explicitly direct human action. The paper that I've written that we are discussing today starts with acknowledging this contemporary situation. However, I also argue from the article's very first pages that explainability is a question of philosophical significance too. And it's precisely this philosophical aspect that I address and develop in the article. I should add here now that while I was writing this piece, I was not interested in engaging in any chicken or egg dilemma, so to speak. This is not about deciding what comes first, the philosophical relevance of explainability in AI or explainable AI as a sociocultural and also technical concern. To a large extent, for me, these aspects cannot be really separated. What I will say in this respect, however, is that those imperatives of opening the black box urged in and by science and technology studies, for example, often bracket the what and why questions that go with this problem area. I object to this bracketing and I move towards the opposite direction by putting the medium specificity of these artificial cognitive agents center stage. This is a sort of constant in my work, no matter how or what we are approaching the digital culture or about digital technologies, for me to address the digital means to tackle the computational. Looking at computation, in turn, means to commit to what I call a non-epistemological investigation of it. I'm talking of epistemology because I want to stress that while we are investigating what computation is and what computation does, that is, its ontology, we are also addressing thought what thinking is and what thinking does. This is then explicitly and quite unapologetically a philosophical position. I'm elaborating on a set of problems to develop their necessary implications. The philosophical question of algorithmic thought that I signposted earlier involves addressing this crucial consequence. What if machines think and we don't recognize their thinking because these cognitive processes are beyond human representations of thought? Here you see the elaboration of the possibility of algorithmic thought involves addressing explainability in AI. And elaborating explainability in AI can be done by producing concepts that extend the limits of that original question. 
The concept that I propose to do exactly that is the concept of incommensurability. In the article, I argued that incommensurability is a powerful philosophical notion to address the question of explainable AI. Originating in Greek, ancient Greek mathematics, the concept of incommensurability denotes the absence of a common unit of measurement between two magnitudes. The development of this concept drove the distinction between geometry and arithmetic, and is also central to the study of ratios of numbers. Outside of mathematics, however, the notion of incommensurability is used to denote that for which no shared nomenclature or shared ground for evaluation exists. In this sense, incommensurability is a key concept in 20th century philosophy of science. In the early 1960s, Thomas Kuhn and Paul Feyerabend have both independently, but equally influentially, developed the notion to assess the epistemic possibility of scientific explanation. So I'll go back to that, those mid 20th century debates and I borrow the concept of incommensurability to argue that explainability in AI is a representational and communicational issue, which challenges phenomenological and existential modes of comparison between human and algorithmic thinking operations. I'm going now to break down this claim to show some interrelated steps in my argument and this point the main results of the paper as well as linking this to the broader context of my work. In the article, I contend that we should pay attention to the specificity of human and algorithmic modes of abstraction because of the different ontological and epistemological grounds of humans on the one hand and machines on the other. Different, in fact, incommensurable kinds of abstraction inform humans mode of thought on the one hand and algorithmic ones on the other. If you read anything else from me, you might have noticed that the topic of abstraction always features very strongly in my work. In conversation, I often say that yes, I study technoscience, but I do that because of abstraction and not the other way around. Understanding abstraction is at the heart of my philosophical project. Much that I've done in the past, for instance, when I was studying and writing on the contingency and indeterminacy of computation, that study was also phrased as an assessment of the ontological significance of computation's abstractive operations. In this newer work, I'm moving on from ontology to enter a more explicitly epistemological arena, but I'm striving to understand abstractions to profoundly inform as much I do in research. In the context of the paper that we are discussing today, I am developing this line by investigating the contemporary expansion of modes, of automated modes of abstraction. They operate via what computer science calls representation learning. Deep neural networks, in the specific, have proved to be the ideal case for the study I proposed. And let me briefly tell you why. Deep learning is an AI technique that, for better or for worse, is at the center of debates about explainability. Chances are that when popular press articles, but also research papers, are alarming us about black boxes, they are indeed talking about the supposed opacity of deep neural nets. The strength of a deep neural network lies in its capacity to find nonlinear patterns in large data sets and improve this performance through iterative interactions that require minimal human intervention. The knowledge generated in these models, however, remains in part implicit due to the nonlinear nature of deep learning, its compressed information, and a difficulty of producing a theoretical underpinning for such complex architectures. What is interesting to note here is that the crux of the problem of explainability in deep learning can be said to lie in artificial neural networks not returning clear representations of their inner workings. In the paper, I engage with this condition by mobilizing the role the representation plays not only in how the machine is supposed to explain itself, but also in how the machine operates in the first place. Deep learning automates the extraction of features from raw data. Features are the properties and characteristics of data that the system learns to distinguish and organize in order to recognize patterns and make predictions. 
Deep neural networks are algorithms for classification from features. And if deep learning is largely representation learning, this is because of the way it operates upon features with multiple levels of representation. What I then contend in the paper is that deep learning, yes, it is changing the epistemic possibilities of justification and explanation, but it's doing so because it's changing the meaning, scope, and use of abstraction as well. Incommensurability is again the right word here and the right concept to bring in because the abstractive choices of human and those of computing machines cannot be measured against each other or compared by a common standard. So I can here return to something I signposted posted earlier in the presentation. Considering an incommensurable dimension for computation is particularly relevant in the context of debates about explainable AI because it allows me to highlight how explainability is a representational problem that pertains to communication. For abstractions to be successfully represented and those expressed and shared, a common experience between the communicator and the receiver of the communication must be in place. Of course, this is not possible in the case of human-machine interactions, for no common phenomenological or existential grounds exist between human abstractions and those of a computational agent. So, you see that while the immediate remit of this issue is clearly epistemological, this position I'm sharing with you also shows, once again, how in my approach, epistemology and ontology can never be really truly detached. Thinking about thinking, or thinking about thinking machines means asking how one thinks, but also, and perhaps always in the first place for me, it means asking what thought is. While returning to these points about algorithmic thoughts that I had flagged earlier, I'm also moving towards the conclusive remarks of my brief talk. And in concluding, I will focus on something that I argue in the last few pages of the article. This is my claim that incommensurability is a translation failure. This is a point that I still draw from the mid 20th century debate in philosophy of science about theory comparison. Incommensurability for Kuhn and also largely for Feyerabend does not mean that a theoretical term, for instance, cannot be interpreted, that it is made intelligible. Rather, it means they cannot be translated and it has no equivalent in another theoretical language. Obviously, there are so many differences from that past debate, quite never resolved and arguably quite niche, and the present often much hyped discussions about and around XAI, explainable artificial intelligence. I hope that it's clear that my investigation of the incommensurable does not want to merely apply those frameworks from the past, what I'm doing is to think with them rather than through them. In the context of explainable AI, a translation failure, interestingly, signals the limits of, approachable, of approaching explainable AI by searching for the quality or property of being translatable. It is important to stress this vis-a-vis -vis current issues in the contemporary quest for fair, accountable, transparent, trustworthy AI, because that quest appears to be predicated on research that understand interpretability precisely in terms of translation. I'm really concluding now with one final thought that hopefully will connect together some of the threats I've been waving today. One of the most urgent tasks, not only for philosophy of technology, but for society at large, is to rethink the alliance between the human and the technological. Human-machine relations must be rethought insofar as many of the previous modes of structuring their rapport have shifted or even sunk, both in theory and practice. Much I've written in the past few years concerned what I call the autonomy of automation. An expression that I use while developing a theoretical approach that considers computational agents not longer just in terms of extensions or enhancement of human cognitive faculties. So I argued and argued again that we should conceive of automated modes of thought in such a way as to supersede the hope that machines might replicate human cognitive faculties and that we should thereby acknowledge a form of autonomy 
in automated thinking processes. To put this now with yet another expression that I often employed, computation is computation. That is to say, the computational procedure stands alongside the living organism, the physical object, and also the mathematical idea as a distinct entity with its own specificity. So this article of mine that we are discussing together was about the 21st century development of computational procedures for which at present, no adequate human cognitive representations exist, and for which, most significantly, human cognitive representations are also unnecessary. The study of this development must be understood as yet another piece in this puzzle of a possible coalition politics between the human and the technological, a possibility that for me, for me must start from acknowledging the prospect of not reaching those types of ontological and epistemological conciliations that, in a philosophical context, various traditions of thought and related way of approaching technology would like us to achieve. And that the field of XAI itself seems also to go for every time it obsesses on finding the right interface, for instance, on one that supposedly could do all that trust for all that epistemic magic that trustworthy human centric AI is expected to be doing. Obviously, this concluding remark of mine is not a resignation from the work that is to be done. Uh, quite the opposite is a call to do more, more work precisely on this area. And I'll stop it here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Beatrice. I think um, one of the good things also about this platform is that um, that uh, is, is we're able to, to watch it uh, again because uh, the, the things that you bring, I think you brought them extremely clear, but they are very, very complex in the sense that um, that um, that you, you take it to a, a level of of, um, of thinking, and I shouldn't say level because you want to think with the 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 uh, the um, uh, with the the building blocks that you uh, that, that you put up. But I think you you managed now to to um, to put this uh, put this forward in such a way that um, uh, that we can um, uh, we can we can we can well I don't want to I don't want to word I don't want to use the word apply or use because that's that's really the, not not the way not the, the word to, to use it. But um, this is the kind but but this is what we need to address. So let's let me put it like this and. Um, um, and I've got lots of notes and lots of lots of questions. But before I, I, I do, we uh, so we also have some questions in the chat. But I would like to um, ask Loretta to give like a first response to your uh, lecture. So hello everyone. It'd be nice to see all of you. But um, so uh, first thing is that we have something in common. So both Gail and I were at Sussex, and Beatrice is now teaching at Sussex. I have an AI degree from Sussex, and one of the things I remember is meeting Paul Feyerabend. However, he was so controversial that when he started, all of the epistemologists like you, Beatrice, would leave the room in anger. I didn't quite understand what it was, but I know philosophers fighting each other. Now, I really like some of the uh, concepts that you are tackling. And uh, it's a really difficult paper, so it requires a lot of brain uh, thinking. The one I like, of course, um, transparency explan and explainability uh, are key. Um, and you talk about thought, but I think the translation is, is, is not that easy, okay? Um, I think of a film like Minority Report, you know, which, which was a key about, can you predict, you know, you're getting so, into the human that you can tell your thoughts before you actually commit a crime. But if you remember, what wins out there is the imagination, okay? So yes, abstraction. Yes, there are people who have these modes. I used to have a boyfriend who worked for SAP and we would always fight. You know, he was so logical. He would write manuals as you can in computer science. Well, you can imagine, I mean, I'm complete opposite. So it's very difficult. Yet humans do all understand each other, okay? So I think the human imagination and the idea that thought is not something you can determine, and you know the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, the famous uh, 
Does language determine thought or does human thought determine the kind of language? Why do the Eskimos have 10 times the words for white snow, gray snow, for snow, when other people don't even have a word for snow? So, um, I, again, um, I think the concepts you picked are the right ones, but my role here is to represent the NGI unit. So Next Generation Internet started with a mission, which is that to see the net from the human perspective. And I funded uh, more projects on feature extraction, uh, you know, the, and uh, artificial vision, artificial life. Um, that was back in the FET days. I also worked on, on, on ARPA, and, and in fact, um, it's not that military. So sometimes military is a way of funding long-term questions that you could not get any funding otherwise. And the reason I say that, because I'm very enthusiastic about the Horizon 2020 and all the framework programs, but they're more like the NSF. A lot of them are basic research. And I, I still think that basic research is something that we need more and more because of a long term, long term. So again, um, the other thing about Sussex, why did I pick Sussex? Because it was interdisciplinary. So when I take your ideas and try to do what my job is to say, OK, what are the NGI policy implications of Beatrice's work? Um, clearly, uh, the idea that systems should be transparent um, or that you should understand when you sign a consent uh, a form. So the explainability is important. But then looking at, looking at an interdisciplinary angle, so if Microsoft Azure has like 50 million lines of, of code and competition policy says, well, look, you know, here, you know, here's the 50 million, have a look, uh, I wouldn't know what to do with it. So systems now are, are so complex um, that I don't think a human or a citizen or a consumer or even a government uh, would be able to make much out of that, okay? On the other hand, I'm, I'm quite enthusiastic about AI, I must say, not just because I funded it, but because I think uh, the vaccine wouldn't have been possible. Uh, you know, when you look at genetic um, and, and medicine and, and discoveries, uh, or also climate change and how do you uh, figure out, you know, these are such complex things that it's a tool that helps us to process a lot of things at the same time. Uh, incommensurable. Um, so I think, again, to sum up, uh, the interdisciplinary, the human angle, I think these are excellent. I fully agree with you when you say that constraints uh, should be put in in the AI. Um, in the AI uh, as used in some industries and definitely not to discriminate, so not to use AI uh, to, to select prisoners, uh, you know, and, uh, or to select uh, people working for the commission, you know, to sort through thousands of, of, of questionnaires and pick the right individuals. Uh, that's a, a disaster, okay? Because you need different, uh, you, diversity and inclusion are my two pet topics as is intermodality. So intermodality is one of the reasons, again, I, I, at Sussex, I met a student, well, a psychosensory. So the body is as important as the abstraction, uh, the algorithmic, uh, what you call the al algorithmic modes of cognition, which remind me of that boyfriend there, or the human modes of cognition. Well, there are not so, there's no such thing as the human mode of cognition, okay? Uh, because I studied with deaf people, blind people, they all get to language. Language is one of those human levels of abstraction, which also animals have, by the way, we're discovering more and more. Uh, they can use tools, they can have imagination. I, I've studied uh, monkeys that said, uh, there's a baby in my cup, okay? So that's clearly a sentence that was created. I, before I stop, I just want to say that the issues you touch, um, this is a, a, a public opinion poll, January 2020. People are worried about the impact of AI. 61% say it moves too fast. 66% say it's difficult, if not impossible, to know if something you see and hear is real or not. 
And if you spend a lot of time on these networks or virtual reality, you are losing your mind in my view. You mentioned trust. So my last uh, trust is very important in terms of policy. And by the way, this project NGI Forward is to develop a strategy on AI. I'm actually very enthusiastic about the use of AI for collective intelligence, um, which is trying to get humans uh, to, to control AI, if you want, as a group, uh, not an individual with a program, but sort of getting to that human level now that we use these tools. So on trust, um, trust is built on competence, which is getting things done, managing governor, governance, uh, but it's also about doing the right thing for society. And when people were asked, and this was a lot of people, it's a Edelman uh, Trust uh, public opinion poll, they said ethics is three times more important to trust in a company than its competence. So I think, again, we are getting uh, uh, back to our human values in a big way. I think COVID has also helped to get back to the real values. So thanks for a very interesting uh, paper. And um, that's all my responses. Thank you. Thank you, Loretta. Maybe Beatrice, you want to respond first to Loretta and then we ask Gail to, for her comments. Sure. Thanks, Loretta, for all these great points. I was uh, noting them down and because there's so much there to discuss. Uh, I'm going to pick just on uh, a couple of points because time is limited, obviously. Um, when you talked about how to bring these kinds of uh, researches into or in conversation with the framework of NGI, of course, the, all the great work that uh, tries to uh, really inform policy and legislation towards a better future for, uh, and also better uh, human-machine relation future that uh, I was pointing to at the end of this paper. For me, the, those two levels, trust and transparency, are, are quite useful metaf metaphors. I understand why people use them. In the context of the work that I'm doing, I'm not explicitly use them much because I'm doing a sort of, um, I'm focusing on what comes before we use that uh, metaphor and that uh, conceptual framework that allows us to think about trust. Uh, for me, um, I've noticed every, every single paper perhaps on ethics and AI mentioned trustworthy AI. It's an interesting, uh, very interesting for me, uh, language choice insofar as trust is never there's so much research on trust, there's never really uh, the debate and never really solidified towards a single definition of trust. And that's perhaps the beauty and the complexity of the topics that we're talking about today. In relation to trust, again, what I'd like to stress is that for me, it's interesting to also to see how that this language, the language of being trustworthy, being reliable, being accountable, is really borrowed from the language of interpersonal uh, communication and interpersonal relations. Uh, it's a language, it's, they are social constructs in a way, ideas of trust uh, and transparency. Uh, and this points to the fact of, uh, to the reality of machines, they are part of that social uh, world uh, as well. So in a way there are social agents that enter in a relation with us and where words and labels about trust and transparency. So my object not, they are not be the idea labels other people understand really like them. Nonetheless, we need to consider how we use them because they're words that come from social interaction and we are in a social interaction with machines. They are social agents. So for me, what's interesting is to look at also these concepts, how they use trust, transparency, in relation to the fact that these machines have uh, agency for better or for worse, and they are parts of the social reality. The other point that you uh, you stress about um, emb embodiment, of course, that's such a, a huge uh, distinction in, in cognitive science as well, and in artificial intelligence, distinction between symbolic AI, connectionism, embodied AI, and of course, deep learning in, in a way, uh, historically in the 80s, is emerged as a, as a response, also an alternative paradigm to those symbolic framework that only focused on symbols as a way to engage with the real and with uh, action and with thought. Uh, my understanding of abstraction is not limited to the symbolic. Abstraction for me, in, in a way, there's no a non-abstractive access to experience. So it's not limited to the symbolic 
AI, but it's always part of also a conversation about embodiment, materiality, and AI as a material infrastructure itself, which uh, yields incredible amounts of power upon society. Thank you, Loretta. Stop here because I know the time is limited. And thanks so much. Thank you, Beatrice. Uh, Gail, can I ask you to uh, to bring your first uh, ideas before we go to the chat? Sure. Um... First of all, I have to say, Beatrice, your paper was unusually readable, but so full of information. I'm going to have to reread it um, just for all these things I realized I missed. Um, so just so I mostly have questions. One, first of all, one uh, practical or rather factual question, if you don't mind elaborating on this because this was raised in the chat uh, and it would be good context for the further discussion. At some point in your paper, you mentioned Jenna Byrne and um, uh, three um, definitions of opacity or three dimensions of opacity. Can you elaborate on that and how it relates to your work? Yes, the, I mentioned this paper that uh, from Jenna Burrell that she distinguishes between type, three types of opacity and, and I thought it was a useful distinction to also uh, think of the way in which we talk about the black box because an AI system can be a black box under many respects. It can be a black box because simply its code is proprietary so it's not open to public scrutiny and it would simply have no access to uh, to the technology behind it, but in theory it could be explainable uh, as such. Then uh, a system can be opaque also because of the uh, lack of literacy or technical literacy in the, in, in the wider population. So uh, many things that could be theoretically explainable, they are less explainable, less interpretable because of um, a lack of technical literacy. And then the third distinction, I'm still drawing from uh, that distinction the, from Jenna Burrell, the, the article I uh, uh, partially quote in the paper, is um, an opacity that is inherent to the non-linear dimension, the complexity, the mathematical complexity of, of these systems. And that's the um, opacity, the black box character, if we still want to use this very flawed uh, conceptual metaphor uh, that I'm really interested in because it's an opacity that's really um, contingent and specific to the kind of technical systems that we are engaging with. So it's not an opacity that is due to anything else that rather than it's just uh, based on a extreme complexity of certain procedures and the non-linearity of the systems, the way in which sometimes uh, we lack or we don't fully have a theoretical understanding of some of the engineering problems that instead work very well. So it's a black box um, insofar as we have the inputs, we have the outputs, but we don't have them or we don't have a fully uh, usable and comprehensive mathematical model for what happens in between the two stages. And that's the third uh, level of opacity that I focus on in this paper. Indeed, that was the one that for which you illuminated a great deal of questions I hadn't even thought about. And you certainly make the case for an entire field, just a new field to be derived, academic field, I mean, out of the different dimensions of the matter that you explore. Um, but um, so one thing that I only just grasped reading your paper is the implications for the scientific fields themselves. And uh, I used to think probably naively that uh, AI was probably more uh, immediately relevant to uh, the scientific fields and should be perhaps uh, either we have them. an echo. Echo, could people not speaking turn off their mics? Oh, okay, sorry. So, but so, what about intuition? What about intuition? If we, how long is it going to take before, let's say, biology uh, or another field that is heavily uh, invested in AI? Um, how long before the scientists themselves lose grasp of the material? How would you address that? <laughs> That's a very, very interesting question and it addresses also like a, a different project that I'm embarking on, on the role of discovery 
in AI and vis-a-vis -vis AI, discovery of theory, discovery of discovery in terms of, yes, intuition, insight, uh, and these sorts of uh, qualities and capacity that often uh, we say humans do really, really well. Um, there are different ways in which to approach this, uh, this problem, of course. Uh, for me, what's interesting here is, in a way, it's to stress how we should move forward like a simulative paradigm, what I call often in my work, the idea that uh, machines will be good if they simulate what we do. So if they at some point get even like imagination, creativity, that's an achievement that make us closer to us. For me, it's interesting to say, uh, if these machines will have something that we even account or consider to be inside or, uh, imagination as to go back to what Loretta was saying or what you said Gail, intuition. What are the specificity of those types Did we lose Beatrice? Yes, we lost Beatrice. I think she hit a, a, a button because it was so abrupt. But um, but we also lost Loretta. We also lost Loretta. So I suggest everyone in the chat and participating gets a cup of coffee as a glass of water, and then we'll be uh, resuming in a few minutes. So um, please take a small break while we wait for um, Beatrice and Loretta to uh, to come back. Uh, seems like the revenge of the machines of uh, yes. uh, getting too close. <laughs> We talk about creativity and imagination. And suddenly the machine lets us, lets us down. The machine sort of starts to, <laughs> starts to think it's getting, they're getting, they're getting on to us probably. Sort of, uh, this is getting too close. We need to. Uh, is the machine already believing that humans are mere enhancement to its operations just to produce the energy, let's say? Yes. Well, this, we have to, <laughs> I mean, this is not a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah. to everyone listening, I have to say, it's really worth it reading the paper. I mean, I read papers all the time, as I guess a number of you do, and this one is especially well written and clear and logically argued, and it's a pleasure to read it. So you would, you would really benefit uh, to read the paper. Well, I certainly benefited because I have so many more questions now. Uh, by the way, I think the paper is actually connected. Uh, there's a link to the paper uh, from the talk uh, page itself. Uh, so that should be, that should help you get it. Uh, or, okay, or I can share it with the chat, I believe. So let's. Uh, I just. I'm on a different computer, so I have to. Let's. Uh, let's give it a few uh, minutes. I think. Ah, oh, here we are. Here we are. Hello. I don't know what happened. I think. Yes, they didn't. The machine didn't like what we were saying about them. Exactly. That's, that's what One we said. more reason to continue. <laughs> that's what we said. <laughs> you just come too close, Beatrice. Sort of. Yeah. A, we talk about imagination and creativity. Yeah. That's what it decides. The but I think, I think, I think the, the reason I emphasized your point about uh, the, the quoting the distinction from uh, Jenna Byrne is that this is exactly the sort of confusion that's, um, um, how do you say, the sort of different absence of distinction that is uh, confusing the policymakers, I believe, as far as AI goes. On the whole, every policy, I, every policy exploration I see confuses those three dimensions of opacity. So the different levels of opacity, you mean? That yes, or oh, the different, let's say, the, the different end purpose or... Yes. The different rationale for, for challenging, for uh, remedying opacity or seeking to remedy opacity. So thank you, thank you very much, Gil. And um, I think um, there are some questions in the chat, and I would like to go to the to, to the first question. But I think your point, Gil, about uh, mixing up this, these opacities and uh, that's a very strong.
policy implication that we can take further. Yeah, and uh, in fact, the third one, which is the one Beatrice is exploring in her paper, which is the one that affects most directly the scientific uh, research, uh, that one is indeed the first one that should be explored and, and addressed, if, if, if at all. Yes. yes, absolutely. I, I think so too. So I would like to go this to this question. Sorry. No, that's it. Sorry. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Gil. And then, so um, I think Loretta is still trying to connect, but we will. We'll, 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 it's, um, so this is the question from um, Raman Murti Badrinath, and he says When you talk about representation and translation, I think one issue is that we don't have a model of human knowledge or understanding. Would you agree? And different humans have different levels of understanding, and therefore, you think, do you think we will be, ever be able to have a model of human understanding? That, that, that's a great point, in, in so far as that um, what I'm arguing here is a comparative epistemology that builds on the, fa on, on the assumption and the acknowledgement that a complete and transparent representation of either the human system or the algorithmic system perhaps is unachievable. So uh, when I'm saying, oh, we are acknowledging, we need to acknowledge the difference and the specificity between the human modes of abstraction and algorithmic modes of abstraction, I'm not implying that we have a full, complete, workable model. We have some models. Some models are better than others for, for human, for understanding human understanding and human cognition. And of course, in the history of cognitive science, there are so many competing frameworks and some are more successful also depending on the, the theories and the circumstances that goes along those uh, framework. Uh, so the comparative epistemology between human modes of abstraction and algorithmic modes of abstraction that I'm arguing for uh, starts from precisely this acknowledgement that we don't even know, we don't really fully know or have a model of that high dimensional uh, levels of representation that work in, in, in human, work in human cognition as well. So it's not that we don't know what machines do because we know what we do. It's, it's, that's a further level of complacency there, certainly so. And another point that I wanted to say in this respect, and going back to the question of trust in this respect, often when I read ethical guidelines for um, trustworthy AI, they're extremely useful and some of them are extremely well thought, but some of, uh, some of them also move uh, um, and start from another assumption is that we need trust, we need to trust the machines because the machines are doing things that are remarkably closer and similar to what humans do. And the point in the paper that I do is if there is a way in which we can apply, although I don't like the word ap apply <laughs> application uh, so much, but let's use that. If there's a way to apply the framework that I'm constructing there is to say that we need trust, we need to trust the machines, not because they're doing things seem remarkably close to the things that we're doing, but because they are doing things remarkably different from, uh, of, from the things we do and with perhaps similar outcomes, but uh, uh, inherently different uh, inner workings. Thank you, thank you. Yes, and um, there was a, also a, a, a comment um, that I would like to um, read from Joe Walton, and um, and it says also trust, transparency, accountability are limited, mostly legal and compliance oriented set of interpersonal relations. There are others we could think about too: intimacy, friendship, companionship, play, revelry. Um, celebration, desire, friend, enemy, role models, pastoral care, humans and pets, etc. Uh, so it's not really a question, but I would like to sort of, uh, um, sort of, would you comment, get comment on on this comment? Um, yes, I agree. There are so many. Um, I think we are talking of trustworthy, accountable, responsible AI for a reason, because we are borrowing from the language of ethics and from the language of le legislative theory and le legislation. And it's, they are productive metaphors or figurative expression that I wouldn't get rid of them, but I would certainly uh, encourage for other types of uh, productive metaphors to go alongside them, uh, but not replace them. I, I still think they have some value uh, 
and that's the same way in which like perhaps in philosophy or humanities thinking has to enter this type of conversation. Yes, it does enter in terms of ethics, but perhaps should also enter it in terms of hermeneutics, political theory, aesthetics, and so on and so forth, not only as a self-contained um, applied ethics. Thanks. Um, there's a question from Simon McGill, and he says, um, I wonder if it's really helpful to construe that third level of opacity as intrinsic to the system rather than as relative to the cognitive, cognitive cap capacities of Homo sapiens. Um, I, I agree, it's intrinsic but relative in a sense from that, that's the phenomenological or the existential perspective that I was uh, um, pointing to before we don't have a shared phenomenological existential perspective but we have always to start from our own phenomenological existential perspective so that uh, it, it, intrinsic there I, I, I meant it as now as an absolute uh, adjective but relative to our way of, of approaching uh, those systems. So intrinsic in, insofar as inherent, proper, specific to them but from our uh, point of view. There's, there's no uh, a view from nowhere as such in these kinds of debates, I believe. Then this is also being being expanded on by Joe um, Walton. Um, again, going to this level of opacity, three levels of opacity, IP opacity, opacity due to lack of expertise, and opacity due to non-linearity and complexity. So the frame is a question, but sort of is is this how we how you also how we can understand it? This this was um, not my distinction and distinction that I I expand upon from from another paper. What what Gael was mentioning. Uh, Jenna Burrell's paper on opacity. And it was a way uh, that I used to frame the types of explainability that we can look for or, or, or engage with. And also to stress that I was in this context of this specific paper, I was expressly interested and explicitly interested in considering uh, the third uh, type of opacity. So that the opacity that is proper to uh, the complexity of these types of system and not the opacity that arrives from um, external causes such as lack of expertise or proprietary uh, systems. So Federico says, Federico Bonelli says, maybe then this third level of opacity, is this, is this in, the, in the realm of unpredictability or is that, is that some, or is that, do you, it's in the realm of predictability in what sense? Sorry, I can, I'm scrolling through, I'm scrolling yeah. through the... Well, I'm gonna, I think what I'm going to suggest, if you don't, if you up for it, is uh, that in a few months, we will set up a session on a big blue button. And then, then if you, if you, it would be fantastic if you could come back because there's so many questions and it would be much, much very good if we could have a, a second hour, maybe at some point, if you, if you will be up for that. Um, on on another platform where we can where we can basically bring more people um, uh, and, and in a more like informal way, so we all get to discuss these things. Because of course we're going to 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 look at this, but it seems that you've really uh, lit a fire here in such a way that we need to uh, to address this 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 more. Uh, it, 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 uh, it definitely sort of something that we that we have to do. Um, just one more question. I see, thank you, Loretta, for coming back, and I will give you the closing word. But before we do that, maybe one question before we go to Loretta and close the session, because this this is also taking some toll on your brain capacity, because we're all here asking you these questions, and you've you really... It's a pleasure. It's a joy to be here. Well, it's a pleasure, absolutely. So um, one more question from Joe Walton. Does that imply that we might, in principle, understand AI, though thought, before we understand human thought? Or is that a separation itself? Is, it, is that an artifact of our lack of understanding? Uh, that's another great question there, that in principle, in principle, we might understand the system we build before the systems we don't get to build, but we get to be embodied in, in the sense that if Often the metaphor of the black boxes is taken from, especially in the history of that metaphor comes from behaviorism, for instance, from the way in which looking at the brain, all in terms of inputs and outputs, uh, precisely because of the complexity and the kind of bracketing the question of what really happens in the mind. And so in a way we, we might 
although acknowledging all the limits of this metaphor of the black box and also the hype around it, we might uh, engage, uh, we might open for, uh, for what is what uh, the black box of AI before we open our own. Uh, yeah, or we can do what AI has always been doing in the field of AI, using the research in AI to understand ourselves better. So going along, the to go along alongside. Uh, often, when people, especially during the super, the so-called AI winters, um, were complaints the AI wasn't being successful. I think AI has always been successful insofar as always shed some light in this sort of question that intimately uh, concern also the way in which we think and understand ourselves and our role in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Beatrice. Loretta, please, can you have your, your, your closing? Um... So I was always with you. It's just the two buttons. Once I turned off my audio and video, I couldn't they just wouldn't work anymore. <laughs> so um, I've been listening to everything, of course, and the chat. So the important thing is there's a lot of people who fear AI. Okay. Now, some fears are scientifically justified. Others are not. Um, you know, there's a difference between theoretical and statistical. And most of AI, most of deep learning is just statistical. Uh, you know, one of my papers that was that, you know, computers are really stupid. They're just extremely fast adders. That's what a, what a computer is, you know, a plus, minus, addition, subtraction. But, but it's these 50 million lines of human creativity in code that make, uh, you know, access to the cloud and, and all these things work uh, simplistically. So I wanted to, to, to address the fear. So... I had fear of childbirth because that was the first time I went into the hospital for an operation. And I, although I could see other people, you know, very natural childbirth, you still fear the first time something happens. So I, I think what Beatrice said that having knowledge about how the technology works, how the internet works, how Facebook manipulates um, attention, I think once you know how it works, uh, you're willing to accept the quid pro quo, even in, in policy terms. You're willing to give up consent in order to get, you know, efficient uh, handling of I don't know how many files at the same time. So I think the knowledge part is really important. And I completely agree with you about knowing yourself. But you have to understand there are limits, okay? Psychologists know that, you know, when you're looking for the, the ideal partner, uh, and you have these matchmaking algorithms uh, that are being sold. Uh, it, these things don't work. A lot is this human uh, your sense of smell, sense of touch, uh, these non-algorithmic uh, approaches. So I think um, this is a very interesting discussion that takes more time. And it would be nice to hear from, uh, there were some very interesting questions. Um, I didn't know that was the start. I've learned a lot of things just from the questions. I'm sorry about my buttons. We have an afternoon. Uh, we, we, uh, this one was one of its kind, I tell you. And um, Beatrice, I think you should also work with cost uh, because cost has a lot of philosophy. Cost is not, is, is not about um, research. It's more about uh, networks of excellence or discussion. So it's highly interdisciplinary. And I think we should do another salon with them. They just had a week of um, audits but uh, this afternoon of course we have smart cities Th problem. thanks Loretta. but thank the, you the, so much professor the, for uh, for getting our, our gray cells to work a little <laughs> point that I, i'll do a response to that that yes definitely i'm i'm, I'm very happy to uh, to participate in more uh, events and it's always uh, i see this is a part of an ongoing conversation really uh, and and the points on on the fear of ai in terms of, we can distinguish it between like fears, like the singularity of machines will take over. I'm quite agnostic around that, and I want to bracket that in the context of this conversation. What I want to comment on is the fear in relation to the ways in which AI is employed today is not unjustified in so far there is an explicit politics around these algorithms. These, these are uh, AI systems are profoundly linked to power structures. So uh, 
perhaps sometimes the, those kinds of fears or anxieties around automation are rightly so connected to this whole uh, larger uh, socio-political way in which these abstraction are also very real material infrastructure with effects on people's lives. Um, and it's interesting to see also how this type of conversation are now uh, getting more recognition and more type of exposure, uh, especially because of the way in which um, AI is having effects on not only the present, but also the future of people. I'm thinking here the case, I'm Italian, but I live in the UK, and it was last summer, there was this big outcry respect, in respect to the way in which um, um, standardization algorithm was used to determine the grades of students leaving high school, secondary school, and going into university. And that was really a case that brought uh, to the forefront of public conversation, public debate, the way in which AI not only informs the present, but as a way of directing uh, human action in relation to the future. So that's definitely a... Oh, I at MIT, I refuse to grade my students on a curve because that means I have to take one quarter and give them the low and one quarter and give. So, and I also had a head of unit who refused to do that in the commission uh, when we were giving points. I think humans have to take their power, stop being passive. Yeah, I would agree. And in the context of the specific case I'm mentioning, it was because um, secondary school exam had to be cancelled because of COVID-19, uh, so uh, students were not assessed through um, the usual means, but an algorithm, and as I say, a standardization algorithm were used with incredibly uh, damaging results for certain types of uh, groups of people. Um, and that's, that's also a great case we can conclude on to go back to the three types of opacity because there was definitely opacity in terms of the way in which these kinds of machines operate, but there was also the opacity in terms of the uh, system that was used by OFQA, uh, the regulatory body that uh, assessed students. Um, it was proprietary, uh, proprietary and not open to public scrutiny and the way in which this algorithm was developed was not really in conversation with the stakeholders or, or teachers themselves. So that's a good case to close here to like an example. They really brought in the, in the UK context, uh, at least uh, at the forefront of public opinion, what does it mean when an algorithm gets to determine, determine your future? Thank you. Thank you very much, Loretta. Thank you very much, Gil. Thank you very much, Beatrice. This was, um, this was very... Um, hey, this, this was brilliant. Yes. And so yes. necessary. So... How do you write it up? Sorry? Loretta, we lost you. Bye. Well, then I'm looking forward to the report. Yes, okay. <laughs> and John yes. Edwards will, will write a strategy report from your yeah. suggestions. Yes. So we hope to have a lot of good good policies yes. uh, on AI coming out of this. <laughs> Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, thanks to the brilliant Bye. people in the chat as Thank well. You, and to Elon Tech. Yes. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Beatrice. So Thank you. Speak to you soon again. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll talk again soon. Thank Bye. you very much. Bye-bye. Ciao.